Thanks for tuning in to Clifton Johnson, A Search for the Heart of America, brought to you by our friends at Porter Phelps Huntington Museum in Hadley. A son of Hadley, Clifton Johnson was a contemporary of Wallace Nutting and like him was among the first generation of photographers and travel writers who helped widen and deepen popular awareness of our great, glorious and diverse America. Trained as an artist and illustrator, Johnson had a strong compositional sense, but was not an abstractionist or modernist like photographer Alfred Stieglitz, also a contemporary. Personalities become enshrined in history because of their accomplishments, but also because of what is often the dumb luck of being in the right place or right circle at the right time. Clifton Johnson and his heirs placed his archive at Jones Library in Amherst which recently completed a massive digitization project which made his photography more available on the internet. I took a look and was enthralled. There is clearly a book or dissertation in all of this, a book I am not going to do, but someone should. This presentation is a tip of the iceberg account of what may be the most important photographic and literary legacy too few know about. Nationally significant, without a doubt. I am going to try to dash through this in the time allotted. If we get cut short, I'd love to do the live version, uh, live audience version of this somewhere in the Pioneer Valley this year or next. Um, Edwin Hadley, this story begins and ends in the place where Clifton was born and is buried beside his wife and partner, Anna McQuesten Johnson. Meet Clifton Johnson. Clifton was born in the village of Hockenham in Hadley in January 1865, just as the Confederacy was collapsing. From the 1880s, after completing his art training through the, through the 1930s, he published and illustrated 125 books and countless magazine and newspaper articles. He dropped out of Hopkins Academy at age 15, worked several jobs in Springfield and began writing and illustrating there before heading off to attend the Art Students League in New York in 1887. He was a self-styled folklorist, photographer, author, and editor. I haven't studied his background in childhood enough uh, or know, uh, so don't know a lot about the young person growing up in an, how a young person growing up in an agrarian community wound up in an art school in New York, he did. Just a little background, photography has been a huge part of my life. I had to grow up in Rochester, New York, and the first museum I ever went to was the George Eastman House of Photography. Um, and uh, Kodak was given birth in the 1880s. And in the 1880s, this is, photography had been invented 40 years earlier, 40 or 50 years earlier, but it really took off in a big way in the 1880s. So Clifton Johnson's timing was impeccable, as was Wallace Nutting. He and John, Clifton Johnson were contemporaries, probably even knew each other, though I'm not sure of that. Wallace Nutting made himself famous through photography in a different way. These are some of his colored photographs, but like Johnson was also a travel writer and evangelist, really, for the sort of New England way of life. These are some of the uh, Wallace Nutting photographs. And there's so many photographers whose legacies have been overshadowed by time and just the way it doesn't take long before a generation or two people forget you even existed. But these are important stories to remember and to tell. Amasa Day Chafee from East Haddam, Connecticut. I won't go into him, but He's one of those legacies. The Allen sisters, some of you may be aware of Suzanne Flint's outstanding book on their photography up in Deerfield. Uh, less familiar to you perhaps is uh, Marie Kendall from uh, Norfolk, Connecticut. She exhibited in the 1893 World's Fair in photography, was a photographer very much in the vein of Clifton Johnson. And then more famous are the modernists, people like Walker Evans, who are well-known names. You can see his work at the Museum of Modern Art, and uh, Dorothea Lang, who is famous. But these are all people who were working, in a sense, in the same vein that Clifton Johnson was, documenting America 
in uh, realistic terms at a time when photography was young and new. Well, this is one of the few pictures in the archive of the Johnson fa family, a rare group picture. Someone probably knows who's who. That's Clifton on the upper left in the back row holding a baby and his pair, Chester and Gina Johnson, are the pictured uh, just the right him. Um, it's a picture of Clifton Johnson's house in the upper right and Edward Johnson's home. I'm not sure. These are both in Hadley. Not sure if either house still survives, but probably they do. Clifton works for a while in Springfield, then goes off to get a more education in art at the Art Le Students League in New York City in 1875. It was located on Fifth Avenue and 16th Street. The art student famous among its instructors, if you know your art history, these names will be familiar. William Merrick Chase, J. Alden Weir, John Twachman, Augustus St. Gaudens, Daniel Chester French, Thomas Aikens, Child Hassam, Thomas Wilmerton, and Arthur Wesley Dow. So this was heady stuff in the 1880s. Uh, he comes back to Hadley and in 1896 marries Anna McQuesten, a, uh, a, a local girl, a school teacher, and a parent collaborator on his projects and work. We'll get back to that in a moment. Uh, initially, oh, and I, of course, should add the long famous Johnson bookstore in Springfield was established by his brother, Henry, in 1893, following several years, himself working in Springfield at Gill's famous art store. Johnson's was more than a bookstore and the most important bookstore in the Connecticut Valley for a century. I remember going there and uh, but, you know, initially, uh, Clifton Johnson did, did illustration. He, and he learned, I'm sure, his compositional sense doing illustration. And this is just, again, tip of the iceberg of some of the images. Of, he, 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 he would illustrate artifacts, historical artifacts, like the loom and the spinning equipment, architectural details. These are beautiful illustrations. And I am sure, I don't know all the details that these were used in his books or publications. Uh, and then the tools, and we'll get back to this when I talk about the Farm Museum and why it's so important. And uh, then these, I think he did a lot of photography and illustration at Memorial Hall Museum in Deerfield. Uh, this is uh, at a time, again, when it was one of the few museums to exhibit this kind of material anywhere in the United States. And I love this. I don't know that anyone else ever recorded the interior internal workings of the, the the funicular that went up to Mount Holyoke. But here it is in 1887. He got inside, he illustrated it, and uh, this is one of the great local treasures that Clifton Johnson loved. He was also, as my wife and I both are, loved cemeteries and burying grounds and did a lot of illustration and photography. I would say it was one of his major areas of interest and then just architecture. So many wonderful evocative images of historic buildings and places, many of them in Hadley, but as we'll see, he traveled all around the world. Well, these books, everybody who was anybody knew who Clifton Johnson was in 1910, 1920. And he was a prolific travel writer. He traveled and, you know, he made a living doing this, which is all by itself pretty amazing. But some of these uh, books on country schools, and he was very interested in the one-room schoolhouse tradition in New England, uh, and travel writing. He went went to the south, he went to the Rocky Mountains, um, and would write these travel books. He was one of the leading travel writers of his generation, and that didn't stop him from hopping in a plane, I guess, or I don't know, maybe they probably took the boat over. I don't think there was airplanes that you would, unless it was Lindbergh as a passenger. But, um, you know, France, England, Ireland, places that he visited and wrote about. I love, I'd like to see the battleground adventures in the Civil War, uh, going to Civil War battlefields. He also, and I don't even know the half the extent of it, but the period that he was working in, say 1900 to 1930, was the high watermark of the postcard era. And the picture on the lower right is from the J Johnson Archive at Jones Library picture on the upper left is a postcard. 
and the same picture, obviously. So he probably sold some of his work to the picture postcard companies. And by the way, that wonderful view of the ferry, and you can see in the upper left there, that's the funicular heading up to Mount Holyoke. What a wonderful image that was. And old houses in Hadley. This home, I didn't know who John Howard Jewett was, but when he described the picture in the archive as the home of John Howard Jewett, he obviously knew who that was and thought it was important. So I Googled it, and he was an important uh, children's book author. And I'm sure probably somebody who was from Hadley, but he had a national reputation, probably somebody Clifton Johnson knew. This image of a woman looking out from a elaborate doorway, I think that's the McQuestin house, or at least it, it was originally it was the Porter house, but the McQuestins, I think, still own it, have owned it for a long time. And then that is an interior view of that extraordinary, it's the oldest house in Hadley, and it's absolutely a national treasure. And uh, this picture shows a larger view of that house, which he described as the oldest house in Hadley. And then uh, the flood at Shipman House in Hadley, uh, he, a lot of flood pictures that he took. And then images of rural life. I love this picture on the left called Cleaning the Family Horse. That's great. It's like cleaning the car. Poor horse gets dirty every once in a while, needs a little sponge bath. And he documented things like this. And then the cornfield scarecrow also in South Hadley. These are images of rural life skating on the village pond in South Hadley. And then, they, then this is a picture called The Elms on the Widest Street in the World. That was the title he gave it, also in Hadley. Uh, and there it is again, the Hockenham Ferry and Mount Holyoke. Uh, these are scenes of rural life. And again, this is capturing a world we have lost. Most people living in 21st century America couldn't identify this stuff if you put a gun to their head. They wouldn't know where they were. They wouldn't know what they were looking at, but it's great. And here is other images of the uh, the halfway buildings as he described them at the uh, Mount Holyoke funicular. And some of those buildings still survive, but the, obviously the funicular no longer does. And then Connecticut River scenes. Uh, these are great ones that show that, you know, again, the local local aspect of his photography but it gets beyond that he, he he captures the regional scene this is amherst college chapel and dorms and again these photographs most of them aren't dated or at least i was unable to determine the dates but they're almost all from you know 1895 to 1930 and some of them are dated but and then uh, on the lower right there the french king bridge between that links uh, i think it's northfield and gill uh, this is a farmhouse upper left in Wendell and a, another farmhouse in Conway. These are So he got around and he was always looking for subject matter. This is the home of the Amherst Historical Society, which he described as the home of the Daughters of the American Revolution. When he took the black and white picture on the left, I took the color pictures on the right. I'm sure the DAR probably were involved in initially saving it. And this is an aspect of regional life not often captured. Mill workers, the rag room in Holyoke, I'm not sure what that is, but uh, the textile industry was huge. And then mill workers at home in South Hadley. The Berkshires and the Highland Hill towns between the Connecticut Valley and the Berkshires, he, he, he documented more places and such situations in those parts of the country than anyone before or since. These are incredibly important documentary images. On the left is a titled A Valley Elm in the Berkshires. On the right is Mount Greylock from the Mohawk Trail. Making soft soap in the Berkshires. He was very interested in um, folklore, customs, social customs, agricultural daily life, uh, work habits of work that were maybe going out of the world in his lifetime but he found places where they continued on this is women making soap uh he's very interested in schools and the one room school tradition a picture on the left titled a request of teacher 
from Peru, Massachusetts, and in the upper right, an old-time school, and the lower right, a country schoolhouse in the Berkshires. And this is uh, upper left is the home of a chopper, wood chopper, I guess, in Zoar, uh, Massachusetts. And then uh, on the right, an old house in the four corners of Worthington. That building I know is still sta standing. And then lower left, the oldest house in Huntington. These are titles he gave these pictures. Someday I'd like to, well, I will go around with some of these pictures and try to re-photograph these scenes as they look today because they're wonderful, wonderful townscapes. Uh, Coleraine on the upper left and Heath on the lower right. Turning sap into maple sugar in Plainfield. The four corners in, uh, excuse me, uh, splitting wood on a frosty morning, also in Plainfield. This is titled Helping in the Kitchen in Plainfield. And then um, Braiding Corn Husks for Doormats in Chesterfield. And on the lower left, lower left, Passing Time in a Shop in Chesterfield. <laughs> on the upper left, Home at the Edge of the Woods in Cummington. And a Hilltown House in Cummington. And I love this picture called, titled Help from teacher in Windsor, Massachusetts. And you, you look at these pictures and you scratch your head and think, how did he get into these situations? Were these pictures posed? And why were they okay letting a photographer in on their private moment? It's pretty amazing stuff. Nobody else captured this the world. Then he went east to the Quabbin towns. This is a load of wood. Uh, entering New Salem, Upper Right, Meeting House, and Old Town Hall in Pelham. That Both of them are still standing. I think are run, at least the Town Hall is the Historical Society now. And then Lower Right is Enfield, Mount Ram in Enfield, Massachusetts, which I'm sure many of you know is now at the bottom of uh, Quabbin Reservoir. So he captured some of the Quabbin towns uh, before the reservoir destroyed them. And then this is uh, Mount Liz on the upper left in Greenwich, Mass., also in the Quabbin towns. And the ancient cemetery in Pelham, well, that's still above ground, and I've been there, some of you may have. A charcoal kiln in Prescott, Mass., also Quabbin. And then uh, the topic on the right is titled Contentment with Newspaper in Belchertown. And the lower right is Clearing Boulders Off a Field in Ware, Massachusetts. And these were all familiar activities in the agrarian age. He wasn't averse to visiting cities. This is Worcester City Hall and Center of Worcester. These are some views of Springfield, the municipal group on the left, the then new Memorial Bridge on the right, and a watering trough on Armory Hill on the lower right near the Springfield Armory. He visited Hartford. This is Main Street on the left. The Keeney Clock Tower, one of my favorite Hartford treasures on the uh, right. And river, the riverfront, view of the riverfront with Traveler's Tower, which was built in 1919, which gives it a little bit of a date. It has to have been taken probably when Traveler's Tower was brand, brand new. And he got, uh, oh, these are other views of Springfield, the um, entrance to the U.S. Armory the Laurel Hill Mausoleum in Forest Park, the original Springfield Library on the lower right, which is amazing, and the old townhouse. I'm not sure what that is, but it's probably on State Street in Springfield. I give the names of these clockwise. And then the Alexander House, which still stands, the Lombard House in Springfield, long demolished, and the Blake House in Eli or Ordinary, long gone in Springfield. So he was also documenting buildings and worlds that uh, didn't make it far into the 20th century. Also made it to Boston. This is Faneuil Hall and Old North Church. Rural and agrarian work. Uh, this And it wasn't just in Massachusetts. A plowman in the Adirondacks. A bit of the title picture in Marblehead titled A Bit of Shore in the upper right. And then I guess they were 
capturing, ca catching lobsters, and then a, a cartload of charcoal on the lower right. And it didn't just stay in New England. This is a, on the left is a tanker in Virginia City, bottom, and advising her man in Indiana. So I guess that's a workman. That's the woman that owns the house, and he's getting his day's assignment. Logging and lumbering, these are logs uh, coming down from uh, Lake Placid, and a loggers camp in Arkansas. I mean, Clifton Johnson got all over the country. There were few Americans of his generation that saw more and probably no one that documented more. Upper left here is a is titled Making a Rug in Brooklyn, Connecticut. Upper right, cleaning uh, boulders off a field uh, in Ware, Massachusetts. Lower right, weaving a rag rug on a loom at Garrett in West Stockbridge. And then the lower left is a shingle maker in Monroe, Massachusetts. Um, historic sites. Clifton Johnson had an interest in literary figures like Mark Twain, he presumably wrote articles or books about Mark Twain. Uh, I don't know all of his literary contributions, but on the upper left here is the birthplace of Mark Twain in Florida, Missouri. Upper right is Twain's boyhood home in Hannibal, Missouri. On the lower right is the Huckleberry Finn House in Hannibal, Missouri. And on the lower left is the cave where Tom Sawyer and Becky Thatcher got lost in um, Hannibal, Missouri. I mean, so he was, you know, these are illustrating articles, presumably. The Longfellow House in Washington, which was also Washington's headquarters during the American Revolution in Cambridge. Upper right, the ruins of Fort Ticonderoga. And the lower left is a John Quincy Adams birthplace all in Massachusetts. Upper left is where Cornwall, Cornwallis surrendered at Yorktown, the upper right. Uh, the cor corner of green where the Minutemen stood in Lexington. And on the lower image is the uh, National Monument in Yorktown. So he was, you know, heritage, tourism, travel writing, all of this was combined. Visited Philadelphia, Independence Hall on the left. Treason Hill, where Arnold and Andre met in Haverstraw, New York. Now, that would make a PhD candidate's uh, quiz test, and probably most today would fail. Uh, but it was well known, that site, in, in the time, both who Arnold and Andre were, and the fact that the, this was where the great betrayal took place. And then the Minuteman in Lexington, it's a statue that is still there today. And the horses, I love the image, the horses drinking out of the fountain, very important, like a, like a gas station today. The, fount, the horses need food and water to keep going. And then th these amazing, where Custer made his last stand in Montana, Clifton Johnson got there, and then this early image of the Alamo. Uh, and other scenes of local color that uh, most people even who live in the region don't know well the, the monument at bloody brook in south deerfield upper left and the west rock cave where the regicides uh lived i love i thought i was going to lose my mind a couple of years ago i finally visited the hadley historical society and by god they've got a bible or a religious book that belonged to one of the regicides uh Unbelievable, and that's another PhD pop quiz test question that most today would probably fail. Uh, house museums, this is the dawn of the museum era, long before Porter Phelps became a museum. Uh, Memorial Hall in Deerfield, George Sheldon was a genius, as I think was Clifton Johnson. The two of them would have adored each other, I don't know if they were met, but that's the Memorial Hall Museum on the upper left, he described it in, as the old academy, now a famous museum. This is, you know, we're not sure when now was, but let's assume 19 teens or 20s. Of course, the old Indian house door on the right and a picture from inside Memorial Hall, somebody, uh, somebody playing 
a, a, a piano. Uh, other images, I mean, th these could be some of the early, I'm sure the Allen sisters got into Memorial Hall and did some documentary work, but these are some of the earliest views of the Memorial Hall Museum, probably again made in the 1920s. And these are more, I mean, I love Memorial Hall is a national treasure. Clifton Johnson, as we'll see later, was really into this stuff and documented it. And of course, the Peter Phelps Huntington Museum or Reverend Huntington's house. I think that's how he knew it at the time. And, you know, these are some great images of the exterior, but also the interior that he made these pictures. Uh, again, I don't know the year, but the, the, the great miracle of Porter Phelps is that almost all of this content is still intact. It's, it's my favorite kind of house museum because it's a time capsule. He also visited the uh, uh, what it, the Stonehouse Museum, now the home of the Belcher Town Historical Society, but founded in 1903, by the way. But, you know, in, in, in his time, you could count the number of house museums and historical museums in the Pioneer Valley. You could count them on maybe one hand. They were rare and precious, and he loved them, so he went. Architecture and old houses and churches, just regional stuff. These are the White Church on Mount Orthodox. I've never heard that location described as Mount Orthodox, but the building is still there in West Springfield. The Rocky Hill Meeting House in Amesbury, Mass on the right, and a village picture called a village church in Lenox on the lower right. This is a house by a river, happens to be in Hinsdale, New Hampshire. I've actually been there. I think that may belong to the Hinsdale Historical Society, too, but he had a beautiful artistic way of capturing that sense of place that is so important now. And then this is an amazingly important topic to me, vernacular housing. He didn't just photograph the houses of the rich. Uh, uh, he photographed the houses of settlers on the frontier, log houses. This is on the left is Grand Island, Nebraska. On the right is Salida, Colorado. On the left is a home in, in the Chinese Quarter in uh, Nevada. And on the right is a, a, a titled In the Pueblo in Acoma, New Mexico. And then this is um, a home on the outskirts of Virginia City, Nevada. And on the right is a picture titled In the Pueblo in Nacoma, New Mexico. So he's really captured when I titled this A Search for the Heart of America. Clifton Johnson's documenting everything. It's, it's really incredible. And, uh, oh, and then gravestones and burying grounds. I already alluded to that. Uh, the upper right is a burying ground in coal rain. And on the lower left is our he titled The Graves of British and American Captains in Portland, Maine. I'm not sure what the long version is of that, but there's a story there, and perhaps he wrote it. On the upper left is Old Saybrook, Connecticut, and on the right is in, in the Old Cemetery in Plymouth, Mass. Deerfield and Hadley, these are some gravestones, including... Uh, Moses Porter, Captain Moses Porter, uh, recently re-photographed that gravestone and won't surprise you, it's in worse condition today. Uh, and so these pictures are also important because they document, you know, conservation conditions of gravestones uh, uh, that are such an important part of our cultural heritage. And I just love this. A Civil War veteran in the Hockenham Cemetery on Memorial Day in Hadley. This custom was very his generation. He documented ruins. On the left is the last of an old house in Worthington. On the right is a deserted house in Rockingham, Vermont. And on the lower right is a deserted house in Savoy, Massachusetts. Before the automobile age, you know, right up until 1940, uh, there were thousands of abandoned and deserted old houses in rural parts of England. So it's great that he 
captured some of this. And then some of them, this is Conky's Tavern in Pelham. That doesn't look like it's long for the world, does it? Uh, and he loved children. And I assume, again, a lot of these are probably illustrations for books or articles he wrote. Uh, this is on the left is titled Up in the Berkshires. On the right is titled Encouraging Thanksgiving Turkeys. Poor turkeys. And then on the lower right is Pumpkin Harvest Hadley. Isn't that great? The little girl in the heart can pull in with a pump. Um, the upper left here is titled Dishwasher and Dish Wiper in Chesterfield. And on the upper right is Starting for School in Hadley. I wonder who that was. And then Skaters in Hadley on the lower right. And Supper for Three in Chesterfield on the lower left. I love the poster on the wall there. It's from the Vermont Farm Machinery Company in Ballas Falls, uh, which is uh, something I know a little bit about. And I love this. On the upper left is titled Capturing Santa Claus. What on earth does that mean? Capturing Santa Claus in Hadley. So they must have found him coming down the chimney and wrapped their arms around him. I don't know. And there are the skaters again. And a game of in in the field in Hadley of baseball. Interesting document. Old timers. He somehow he talked his way into these homes and captured the, a world uh, of another era and another time. On the upper left is Grandma and Grandpa in Chesterfield. On the right is an old farmer and housekeeper in Hadley. And then on the, the lower picture is by a home fireside in Ashfield. And boy, that is the quintessential image of agrarian, aging agrarian life. Um, old folks at home in a log cabin in Montana on the left. When winter comes in Leverett Mass in the center. And an old farmer sits with a newspaper in West Stockbridge. I love the way that also captures uh, farm life and furnishings. In Again, I'm going to assume most of these are around 1810. His fascination with schools, Clifton Johnson collected uh, antique school books and primers. And I think that collection is at the Jones Library. Uh, on the left is titled In a Country School in Plainfield. And then... On the right is a class in geography in Hockenham. Decorating the school for George Washington's birthday in Hadley. Uh, on the right is geography class. Two who knew, throwing their hands up with the answer. I mean, he really had a poetic way of captioning his photographs. And then on the lower left is going to school with teacher in Chesterfield which is great. You see the teacher walking to her kids to the class. Uh, on the upper left here is the first building of the Tuskegee Institute. On the right, a girl pupil and teacher at Harper's Ferry. And on the lower left is Negro children and their school in Florida. And we'll get back to that. His documentation of the African-American experience in his time is extraordinary. This is winter. He did a lot of photography, got out in the winter. It's a cabin in the Glen in Yosemite in the upper left. A placer miner on skis in Leadville, an early image of skiing in Colorado. And then the lower picture is titled April Roadway to Yosemite. He probably made the carriage stop so he could get out and take a picture. Logs down from Lake Placid on the left, getting a pail of water in the Adirondacks on the right. I love winter photography and winter art. And this is titled After a Storm in the center of town in Goshen, Mass. And on the lower right is filling the farm ice house. Uh, and uh, Mount Nan Nanotuck in Hadley on the lower right. On the left, this is Bristol, Rhode Island on the, le the, the left and Dover, New Hampshire on the right. 
And then, I don't know what this is about. The title says, Foreign Looking Main Street in Gloucester, Mass. What does that mean, foreign looking? Who knows? But he titled his pictures, and they, the titles are as interesting. You can also see the tracks for the trolley. But he took the picture when the trolley wasn't there. On the left is a moderate-sized city in Hamilton, Ohio. And on the right is the chief street in the capital city of Carson City, Nevada. Heritage tourism. He went to places that tourists went to. And in fact, I'm sure his writings facilitated in tourism, got people interested in visiting these places. On the left is picturesque Mackinac Island in Michigan. On the right is Mount Desert Island in the harbor. A guide in the Grand Canyon of Arizona, and then a pilgrim by the woods in Plymouth. A Gettysburg on Cemetery Ridge, the high water mark at Gettysburg, and Bull Run, where Stonewall Jackson stood like a stone wall on the lower left. So he did a book about Civil War historic places and visited many of them. The Burnside Bridge in Antietam. Got up to Quebec City, the gate to the city on the left, a farmhouse near Lachine on the upper right, and Chateau Ramazé, which is a museum now in Montreal. Shakers, he's interested in the Shakers, the public was at the time. Enfield, New Hampshire, upper right. Sarah Collins, New Lebanon, on the uh, upper, excuse me, upper left was the first one. Upper right is Sarah Collins. An Enfield, Connecticut, Enfield, New Hampshire dwelling on the lower right, and one of four Shakers left at Mount Lebanon on the lower left. So he was then capturing a world that was about to be lost. Visited some of the islands that are popular with tourists today, were beginning to be so at the time. This is Monhegan Island in Maine, Nantucket. Block Island, and if you go to Block Island today, the, the, the topography is the same, but the, there's so much that has changed. These places were almost denuded of trees at the time that he visited, so you don't see a lot of what you would see there today. And of course, some of the things like the uh, whale bone arch, I'm sure, are long gone. The stone walls are still there, but... He also got up to Mount Washington and the Canadian side of Niagara and the American Falls of Niagara. Traveled extensively in the South and documented a world that uh, very few Americans of the time knew much about. Uh, lower left is a front porch in Natural Bridge, Virginia. On the right is at the post office in Georgia. The Ohio River in Wheeling, West Virginia on the left, an old plantation home in Louisiana, and then on the lower left, a home of, this is the title of it, the home of a Georgia cracker, which is a poor white person of that time. African American, there's incredible material. And again, this is just the tip of the iceberg. This is two uh, African American young fellows Fishing in a canal in New Jersey on the left. A black couple in their yard in Vicksburg, Mississippi on the right. Black section of a town in Suwannee, Florida on the left. An Alabama kitchen on the right. Home of Negro family in Tennessee on the lower right. And then the, an assembly shed of a Negro camp meeting in Alabama on the left. And, you know, there are a fair number of slave quarters, uh, you know, left in the South. But some of these more ephemeral buildings like the uh, 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 assembly shed there on the lower right, long gone. The only thing that would be left are photographs like these. And then a girl pupil and teacher at Harper's family, a fairy, I guess I already showed this, and a black family on a porch in Vicksburg on the right. And then a cemetery of the colored people in Tuskegee, Alabama, and a some title, picture titled Plantation Porch 
in South Carolina. Hobos, hermits, and factory hands. Uh, on the left is hobos eating their one square meal in California. And on the right is a hermit's home in West Tisbury in Martha's Vineyard, where today a million dollars wouldn't buy you much of a house. But we won't go there. Uh, and now I love this title, Dull Time Out of Work in Holyoke. So it's, you know, documenting the factory mill culture of his period. The West traveled extensively in the West. On the left is the chief street and capital city, Carson City, Nevada. Nevada. And on the right is the Golden Gate from Fisherman's Wharf, but no Golden Gate Bridge yet. This is titled In the Camp in Showstone Falls, Idaho. On the, the sunny side in Sagebrush, Brush, Nevada, and the back door of an adobe house in Utah on the right. It's again a home in the Chinese Quarter in Wyoming. Kitchen fireplace in my, Missouri, and old folks at home in a log cabin in Montana. And this is in Oregon, a salmon net on the upper right. And then a salmon wheel on the Columbia River on the lower left. Uh, an Indian bark house uh, documented the life of Native Americans. Indian bark home in Montana. An abandoned Indian hut in Nevada on the lower right. And a birch bark wigwam in Montana. This is an Indian family at home in California, and an Indian wagon in Oklahoma, and an Indian, a Navajo weaving a blanket in Arizona. Went to Texas, documented boys, hogs, and oil wells. Uh, and then upper right, oil fields in Beaumont, Mont, Texas, and lower right is Sour Lake in Texas. Traveled and documented the heartland, a typical home in Nebraska, upper right, fortune seekers traveling through the Ozarks in Missouri. I think I showed this already, advising her man in Indiana on the left, and then the news in Missouri. Making friends with a pig, that's the title of the picture, from Nebraska on the left, and first settler's home in Grand Isle, Nebraska. Bill, I'm going to just give you a sort of 10 minute till the end warning. Yeah, that's great. I'm, people I'm, would like questions. I'm, I'm right close to that, so I'm going to move quickly. You know, we'll skip Europe, but we'll do this another day. You don't want to know why there's a pig in Newport, Ireland, Ireland, but there it is. And cottage interiors in England and Ireland. I'll move along. A lot of pictures of his friends. Clifton Johnson had some prominent, influential friends, Elbridge Kingsley, well-known in Hadley and Hatfield, the local artist, but uh, Hudson Maxim, Maxim less well-known today, Charles Dudley Warner, one of my heroes, that's a grist for the mill of another day. He was a co-author with Mark Twain of the book that gave the name to the Gilded Age, and then uh, William Dean Howells, a publisher who I'm sure Clifton Johnson worked with, and he documented his home. And then John Burroughs, the great naturalist, uh, again, uh, 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 grist for another day. Well, I'm going to wrap this up. The Hadley Farm Museum, founded in 1930, Clifton Johnson wrote that Hadley is the most beautiful place on earth. Any prospective museum should be located there. I wholly agree. Uh, I assume Clifton Johnson and his family were involved in collecting, curating, and presenting what's there, which hasn't changed much, thank God, since it was founded in 1930. It is, in my view, one of the five most essential museums in the Connecticut Valley, a topic for another day. And these are just a few images that uh, show the farm museum as it looked. The way things are arranged and presented is stupendous. It reminds me a bit of the museum created by the artist Eric Sloan in uh, Connecticut. So uh, to conclude, there's something about authenticity and intentionality 
of these gravestones that you can't fake or make up. Here in the Hocken Burying Ground, walking distance from where Clifton was raised, he and his wise and friendly advisor and fellow world traveler, Anna, this is their final resting place and the final statement of purpose. Have you ever seen gravestones like this? Me either. The moral of this story is that genius can strike anywhere and any time. What makes the Johnsons almost unique is that despite worldliness and extensive travel, Hadley remained their touchstone and the center of their lives. It reminds me of nothing so much as Wendell Berry, a poet, writer, essayist, and public intellectual. Berry was born almost 70 years after Clifton but they would have understood each other implicitly and deeply. Barry writes of how a viable community is made up of neighbors who cherish and protect what they have in common, of how the experience of growing up in a community in which virtually everybody was passionately interested in the quality of a local product was, I now see, a rare privilege. And he finally wrote, it is by the place we've got and our love for it, and our keeping of it, that this world is joined to heaven. Can you think of a more essential idea, needed now more than ever? I can't. Thanks for listening. Yeah. Um, this is Carl Johnson, and uh, Clifton, or CJ as we refer to him, was my great-grandfather. I did not know him. Um, but there are several other Johnsons on the call here, as you might have noticed. And um, I just wanted to say that uh, it was several years ago that a few of us raised the money and contributed the money to digitize this collection. And we did so precisely with the hope we did so precisely with the hope that somebody like you might discover this collection and make his work better known to a wider audience. And so I just wanted to express yeah, my awesome. sincere appreciation on behalf of all those who contributed uh, time and money and energy into that digitization process. So thank you, thank you very much. But there is something, Hadley and Hadfield are so authentic and in an age where so many things have been ruined and destroyed, these are essential communities that uh, still are agricultural, still have so much in common with this past. And I, you know, I just love the Farm Museum. And sometimes I worry a little bit that, you know, will the next generation take care of these things? And how do we protect them and make sure they're there for the next generation? And I, we don't need a long conversation about that. But the Porter Phelps, the Farm Museum, the Bearing Grounds, and absolutely the Hadley Historical Society, these are all important things. And if, if there was an effort to, I don't know, protect them, help them, support them, that would be a very positive thing because most yeah. places don't have this. Uh -huh.